I'm Pat Zerke, the director of Cambridge Forum, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this program as we host Boston Globe art critic Sebastian Smee in conversation with art historian, author, and curator Paul Tucker. Our forum tonight will be led by Paul Tucker, the Paul Hayes Tucker Distinguished Service Professor of Art, a chair that was established in his honor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where he has taught art history since 1978. Regarded as one of the foremost authorities on Claude Monet and Impressionism, Tucker has curated more than a half dozen international exhibitions in the United States, Europe, and Japan. The author of 11 books, he recently completed the catalog of the 19th and 20th century paintings in the Lehman Collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And he is now writing a college-level textbook on modern art called Never Neutral, Modern Art Courbet to Pollock. A hallmark of his approach to the study of art is a multi-layered integration of art, history, and biography. Tucker has served as president and chairman of the board of the Terra Foundation for the Arts and is founder and director and moving force in the continuing expansion of Arts on the Point, a public sculpture park in Boston. Thank you very much, Pat, and welcome to Cambridge Forum discussing learning to look with Sebastian Smee. I'm Paul Tucker, as you just learned, and I'm an art historian and curator. I've had the great privilege of organizing a variety of exhibitions around the world, as you've heard, mostly on Impressionism and particularly on Mr. Monet. Our conversation this evening will explore the ways in which we have analyzed and come to understand works of art. Although Sebastian is a critic, and I am a historian, we actually, over all of our years, have shared very similar interests and concerns about critical issues, and particularly the issues of meaning, the meaning of a work of art, the meaning of that work to the viewer, the meaning to the artist, the meaning to his contemporaries or her contemporaries, and ultimately, in the end, the meaning in terms of history. Sebastian Svi is the art critic of the Boston Globe. He won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize in Criticism for what the Pulitzer Committee called his, quote, vivid and exuberant writing about art, often bringing great works to life with love and appreciation, unquote. Prior to joining the Globe, Sebastian was national art critic for The Australian and has also worked for The Daily Telegraph, written a regular column for Prospect Magazine, and contributed to a number of other publications in the United Kingdom. Sebastian has written a book on the relationship between Matisse and Picasso, and the text to go with five books on Lucian Freud. He is currently completing a new book, and his weekly, quote, frame-by-frame frame articles focusing on individual works, organizations, and events in the New England art world have become truly must-reads items in the Boston Globe. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Sebastian Smee. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, it's an honor to be here with, with such an esteemed art historian uh, whose work I've known and read for a long time. It's lovely of all of you to have come here tonight, especially braving this uh, inclement weather, uh, which I'm getting used to here in Boston after six years. Uh, and thank you so much as well to Pat for inviting me. Um, there's a sentence, it's a sort of cliche that you've probably all heard before, and which I personally run into a lot. It comes up often when I'm in conversation with someone who asks me what I do for a living. When I reply, always admittedly with some embarrassment uh, that I'm an art critic, it's often only a matter of moments before I hear something along the lines of, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like. Quite often those exact words in that exact order. Usually, of course, it's said with a, a little glimmer of irony, which I enjoy. But I find that there's something strangely passive-aggressive, too, about the impulse to say it in the first place. 
And so I've often wondered what it means and what it might indicate. You don't often hear it in relation to music, for instance, or any other field I can think of. It's a comment that seems specifically reserved for visual art. On the one hand, it sounds like an expression of a certain kind of insecurity. And that makes sense. For many people who don't know much about it or who have had little exposure to it, art can seem daunting. Stories about it, too, can be dismaying. The idea, for instance, that someone could be willing and able to fork out $150 million for a single painting is inherently obnoxious. And many other aspects of art can also seem annoyingly infantile or unbearably pretentious. So that insecurity that is born of not knowing can easily turn into a kind of contempt. And both are there, I think, in that cliché that I'm talking about. Mind you, art is hardly the only field which can seem hard for outsiders to understand. Talk to me about investment banking or theoretical physics or gardening, and pretty quickly, I'm at a loss too. Even though, in truth, I would very much like to know very, uh, a lot more. Art is actually a pretty basic subject compared to those others, and in many ways, it's a lot more approachable. Museums are everywhere, especially in this part of the world, and they're easily accessible. There's plenty of chatter about art in newspapers and magazines and online. And whether we're watching the opening credits to Desperate Housewives, or using the image hosting uh, service Picasa, or employing phrases like 15 minutes of fame, a certain amount of shared knowledge about art is taken for granted in our culture. So why does art attract this strange reaction, this reaction that, even as it owns up to ignorance, seems to sweep aside the idea that expertise would be of any value in the first place. It may seem perverse or counterintuitive or a bit of a stretch, but I see the reaction as in some ways a fascinating byproduct of the enormous influence of modern and contemporary art on our culture over the past 150 years or so. After all, in earlier art, talent and skill were always intimately connected to aesthetic worth and easy for all to see. Even today, everyone can appreciate the skills of a Michelangelo or a Titian, and no one's really going to take issue with the idea that these artists did what they were trying to do with unprecedented skill. But the claims made on behalf of a scrappy-looking painting by Cy Twombly, or a video by Matthew Barney, or even a colored paper cutout by Matisse, not to mention the prices these works fetch, can often seem so extravagant that when measured against the work itself, they inevitably come up short and ultimately may trigger dismay. And with that dismay, as I said, comes a certain defensiveness or even hostility. I get it. And I'm not surprised when I sense that defensiveness, that hostility, that scorn. When I'm thinking about this tension between expertise and ignorance, between professionalism and naivety, I always like to remember something that was said by the late British painter Lucian Freud. When you find something very moving, he said, you almost want to know less about it. It's a bit like when falling in love, you don't want to meet the parents. <laughs> I like this idea, and it leads me to think that ignorance, although it's usually defined negatively, and for good reason, can also describe something more positive, a state of receptiveness unobstructed by prejudice or by partial second-hand knowledge or by outdated ways of seeing. That's to say, ignorance or operating in the dark can actually be tremendously generative. As a form of not knowing, it's linked to curiosity, to thought experiment, to desire. And it's definitely, definitely linked to art. I think we've all probably had the experience in an art gallery of being surprised and extremely affected by something and not wanting to know more, not wanting to have a curator or a critic or a wall label get between us and the experience we're having. I happen to believe this feeling is an extremely precious one. And I think if we're all going to talk about art, we need to try to find ways to protect the possibility of succumbing to it. I also believe that possibility even more than the opportunity to educate or enlighten or somehow to edify or civilize, is really the prime reason, certainly not the only reason, but one of the prime reasons that museums of art exist. 
but it's a possibility that's under attack. We've reached a point in our culture where theories and critiques have become so dominant that the primary encounter between an individual and a work of art is no longer regarded as sacred or even particularly valuable in many cases. The problem has become endemic. Concerted attempts to mediate experience through wall labels, through acoustic guides, exhibition design, and even museum architecture are everywhere. And they're often all but unavoidable. It's as if people need someone else's interpretation just to form a relationship with a work of art. Now, of course, I don't believe there's ever any such thing as a pure, unmediated experience of art. We're all affected by our moods, by worries about getting parking tickets, by what we had for breakfast, and of course, by whatever we may already know or think we know about Warhol or Monet or Dale Chihuly. And that's entirely natural. But we do, despite these factors, still have the ability to think for ourselves when we're called upon. And I'm inclined to think that a lot of the time we don't make the most of it. As an art critic working for a daily newspaper, I'm obliged to share facts and information that I find relevant and interesting. And I love doing that. But I don't actually believe my role in the final analysis is to educate people about art. That's better left to people more qualified, like Paul and many others. Um, rather, it's to make critical judgments, to encourage debate, and hopefully to convey a certain amount of passion and, and enthusiasm for the subject. So when someone says, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like, part of me wants to say, good for you. Go with that. Embrace it. Embrace your ignorance. Use it and let it be a passport to fresh ideas, fresh feelings, and a weapon against received wisdom and cant. That's certainly how many modern artists have thought of the condition of not knowing. The painter Francis Bacon, for instance, said that whenever anything does work, in my case, it works from that moment when consciously I don't know what I'm doing. A huge number of great modern artists, when asked to describe the creative process, have expressed a similar sentiment. So maybe it's the same for looking at art. As I said, I think the not knowing much about art but knowing what one likes cliché is more than just an expression of insecurity or hostility. I think it's also at times an expression of something that's very dear and very important to art, and perhaps especially to modern art. Ever since about the 1850s and 60s, when inherited criteria for what constituted a good painting began to break down under the influence of rapidly changing social conditions, and of course the innovations of artists like Courbet, then, then Manet and the Impressionists, and then the Post-Impressionists, and then Matisse and Picasso, and Kandinsky and Mondrian and Duchamp and so on and so on. All through this period, and right up to today really, the very idea of expertise in art, of exercising judgment according to a received set of criteria, has repeatedly been turned upside down and inside out. And of course, among many other effects, this has put art critics in an invidious position. But what began to count far more than expertise or skill was a sensibility, a way of looking at things, backed by a set, a set of ideas that were often nebulous, but always in pointed opposition to conventional notions of quality. And so the idea that there was merit in coming at the tradition of art from different angles, from, say, a nonchalant and playful perspective, as in the case of Manet, or a childlike perspective, as in the case of Matisse, or a utopian perspe perspective, in the case of Mondrian or Malevich, or from an irrational perspective, in the case of Dada, or even from an uninformed and untrained perspective, in the case of Dubuffet and Miro and de Kooning and countless others, all this gained great traction. Indeed, the story of modern art is, in many ways, the story of how these different, oblique, and novel approaches were variously adopted, one after the other, and transformed into great works of art, and into a climate of critical reception. I'm putting it all extremely crudely, of course. It's not as if the idea of skill or expertise disappeared entirely. But I'm trying to make the point that not knowing much about art, but knowing what you like, Although it sounds philistine and insulting to people who have spent their lives studying or practicing art, it can also be seen as just another expression of this ongoing resistance 
to received wisdom and to the dominance of official culture and of the thirst for new and immediate experience. I think this is good to be aware of, but in emphasizing it, I would sound just one note of caution. I would say this. I would say that when it comes to art, don't let ignorance, don't let not knowing be a kind of chastity belt, a symbol of prideful renunciation. Don't let it cordon you off from experience. Because in the end, quite obviously, knowing a few things, just a few handy things, and eventually maybe a lot of things, can actually open up whole new worlds of mysterious and transforming experience. You may know what you like, but if you don't remain open to the possibility that you may like many things you don't yet know of, you are being your own worst enemy. So what I want to protect, I suppose, is that feeling of susceptibility, both in myself and in anyone hap who happens to read my reviews. There are times when certain kinds of information conveyed in certain ways can enhance that feeling of susceptibility. And that's what I'm always trying to do. But there are other times when it gets in the way, when it's too much like getting to know the parents, a duty, a chore, a kind of a wet blanket. I do, as I said, believe that the more you know, the more your experience of art can deepen. But in the end, when I'm standing in front of a great portrait by Van Gogh or a still life by Chardin or an etching by Rembrandt, what I do or don't know is no longer really the point. I was reflecting on all this recently when writing uh, about a favorite, a favorite picture of mine, uh, a picture that Degas painted in the late 1860s. Unfortunately, it's not in Boston. I, I had to go all the way to, uh, to the Japanese island of Kyushu to see it. Um, and I was lucky to do so just last year. But it's a very mysterious painting, and it's congested with unknowns. Some uh, are uh, known unknowns, to adopt the parlance of uh, Mr. Rumsfeld, and others are very much unknown unknowns. The more I found out about this painting, the more it intrigued me. But when I went to Japan and actually stood in front of it, I was moved by it in a way that really had very little to do with everything I had in the meantime learned. The picture remained as mysterious and as fundamentally unknowable as ever. The painting I'm talking about, I should say, shows Degas' friend Manet leaning back on a couch and listening to his wife, Suzanne, playing the piano. What's strange about it is that when you get close, you see that a section of it, between about a quarter and a third of it, is missing. It's been replaced by an empty section of canvas, which has Degas' signature at the bottom. Now, the 1860s was a long time ago, but it was a decade in which one of the dynamics that ended up being central to modernism a dynamic which, in a way, is connected to what I've been talking about, began to establish itself in art. I'm talking specifically about a tension between an idea of life as an, a knowable phenomenon and an idea of life as an unknowable phenomenon. A tension, that's to say, between 19th century positivism and the whole Enlightenment tradition, on the one hand, and on the other, a developing reaction against this tradition, an insistence in the face of onrushing modernity that life should remain mysterious, enchanted, and unknowable. By the 1880s, this dynamic was making itself felt as a tussle between, and again, I'm putting things very crudely, and I feel embarrassed even saying this in front of uh, Paul, but a, a tussle between the naturalism of the Impressionists, who tried to depict the actual conditions of colored light and the real appearance of things, and the symbolist-inspired, often Arcadian reveries of post-Impressionists like Gauguin who tried to paint a dream world of suggestion and poetry. But this dynamic was already there in the 1860s, and you see it subtly, I think, in the rivalry between Degas and Manet. I think of Degas, at least in the 1860s, as the positivist, wedded to an idea of truth as knowable. He once said that one has to commit a painting in the same way that one commits a crime. But in a way, he was more like the detective who comes along after the crime always looking for clues. Degas had met Manet earlier in the decade, in 1861, and Manet had inspired him to revamp his whole aesthetic, to address contemporary life, and to make himself, despite his classical academic training, truly modern. But even under Manet's influence, Degas held on to a different idea of what being modern entailed. He had an idea that portraiture, in particular, 
could reveal truths about individuals and indeed about society that even novelists would struggle to express. He'd become friends around 1865 with the writer Edmond Duranty, who discussed with Degas the idea that facial expression, in particular, could reveal a great deal about psychology. Duranty wrote a pamphlet called On Physiognomy. Physiognomy is the study of facial expression as an index to character. And from Degas' diaries and notes, we know that he was very taken with the idea that in his portraits, by attending carefully to facial expression and bodily gestures, he could pin down character. Manet? Less so. In the 1860s, Manet was still very much under the influence of his friend Baudelaire. The poet and critic had died in 1867. Manet was fundamentally allergic to the idea of hidden, knowable truths. He had secrets and he liked to keep them. He was in love instead with the surface of things, the dance of appearances. His paintings of the 1860s are filled with masks, costumes, and other disguises, a constant game of charades. His most famous models were almost always expressionless. So, given all this, it's interesting, surely, that the part of Degas' double portrait of Manet and his wife, Suzanne, that is missing is Suzanne's face. What happened? What happened is that Degas gave the finished picture to Manet in exchange for Manet's still life of plums. Sometime later, we don't know how long, Degas visited Manet's studio and saw that his picture had been slashed with a knife. Manet, it seems, had, for some reason, taken against it and cut out the part of the picture that shows his wife Suzanne's face. Degas, who was presumably shocked, took the picture home and sent Manet's still life back to him with a note that read, Sir, I am returning your plums. So why would Manet, this man whom everyone seemed to love and who, as his friend Fantin Latour wrote, always approves of the paintings of people he likes, why would he do such a thing? Well, I have my ideas and I love to think about it. And I hope that we can talk about it in due course. But the fact is that in the end, I don't honestly know. And I don't think anyone ever will. But the picture is still there, as unknowable and as electrifying as ever. And that, for some reason, feels like a good point to uh, turn this strange monologue over into a discussion. Um, and uh, uh, I'll take my seat. And thank you very much. <laughs> you are listening to Cambridge Forum as we continue our discussion of learning to look. So are, are we on? That's great. But that was fantastic. He would be a star in my class. It, it was just one. I'd be lucky to be. Thank you so much. It was really so rich, so filled with thought, and, and also filled with feeling. Just as the Pulitzer Associated Prize Committee said, feeling and appreciation is there in every word. And I think that that is something that has often been lost in criticism over our last while, as you have implied. Perhaps we should begin maybe with that very mysterious portrait in Kitikushu, uh, Japan, which if you've not been to, go. It has one of the greatest Monets, one of the great late Monets of all time. It is beautiful, and it hangs in the same room. It, it, it's yeah. a, a great dialogue. Because that painting, as you rightfully raise, uh, Sebastian, is so mysterious, so inexplicable on so many levels, that we could, of course, probably spend the entire evening here talking about what it may be. And to my mind, it sort of suggests one thing that you touch upon and, and place it in great, uh, uh, in great value, and that is the mystery of art. The ways in which we respond in some kind of intuitive, perhaps slightly informed way, by something that is in front of us. Let's narrow it down to a painting as opposed to a piece of sculpture, something like that. So, would, could you talk just a little bit about that notion of intuition as you stand in front of a picture like that? 
Well, I mean, I was, I, the fact that this picture is, is uh, in this museum in Kitakyushu, as you said, on the island of Kyushu, um, meant that just getting there, I was <laughs> filled with such sort of excitement. I'd taken a bullet train for the first time in my life, and uh, I was in Japan. I'd been there very briefly previously, but basically it was the first time that I'd spent any considerable time there. And so you arrive at museums, wherever they are, with, in a certain state of mind, and I, th I think that's always fun to, to, to take into account and to be aware of. And I know that finally arriving in this gallery with, as Paul said, the, the wonderful late Monet, uh, and this rather small picture uh, by Degas, I was almost sort of intoxicated with, with anticipation um, in a way that almost embarrasses me. But, it, but uh, you know, I, I wanted to get up close. I wanted to see things like the, the, the join where, where the, the canvas had been repaired by Degas, who did intend to repaint it, and that's why he repaired it, but never got around to it or decided against it. And that's why his signature is, is, is there on, on the bottom in the corner. Uh, but as I say, I, I was filled with sort of information and ideas about the picture, which I'd seen in reproduction many times. But what I wasn't prepared for was, was this shock of being in front of the actual thing. And uh, I hadn't really noticed in reproductions, which pr probably hadn't been good enough, but I hadn't noticed the, the richness of this sort of turquoise colouring that spreads out around the figure of Suzanne Manet. Uh, the delicacy of Manet's shoe. He wears a sort of pointed leather shoe, which is beautifully With a pair of spats. Right, right, exactly. Uh, and a waistcoat, and uh, he's looking very dapper, as Manet allegedly always, always did. Uh, and Suzanne, his wife, is there at the piano. As I say, we can't see her face, but uh, she's wearing a, a blouse, which Degas, in a sort of amazing touch, has made transparent, except, of course, at the seams. And, and it's just a bravura touch that, that he sort of conveys the, the slight transparency of the, of the, of the blouse, uh, but makes sure to sort of indicate the seams where light doesn't get through. So there are all these things that I noticed about it, and, and I just had such a... a a wonderful feeling in front of it, that, that all the ideas I had about it kind of disappeared. <laughs> and yet, and this is something I want to stress, th that feeling, that sense of, of um, magic that we sometimes feel in front of works of art should hopefully open out onto a desire to know more. Uh, and I've spent months subsequent to that visit finding out more and more and more about the picture and developing more and more ideas about it. But, um, you know, I, I, I value that that face-to-face -face immediate experience enormously, um, but in me it does trigger a desire, a desire to find out more, and I think that that is a crucial part of what I was trying to, to say. Well, I think one of the points you make is seeing the actual work of art is an experience that is so vastly different from every other kind of experience, particularly if it's anticipated in a certain way. And I always urge my students to go to museums and to actually look at these things physically because there is something that occurs between you standing there and that thing on the wall that is utterly inexplicable. But what, I, what, I'm, what I'm interested in when I hear that very same phrase, uh, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like, I concentrate on the, on the second part. Right. You take the positive because if they like something, they've already defined a certain set of criteria for what they believe is supposed to be a recognized work of art. It may be skill, as you said. It may have something to do with the ways in which paint is manipulated or whatever it may be. And then, as an educator, and you as a critic, I'm sure you would agree, that you then build on that to be able to say, okay, let's define what you like. Right. And why do you like that? Because we all come to these things with our prejudices, just innately human. And if you can build on that to be able to then construct a kind of personality of liking things, then you can open that up. I always tell my students when they go to a museum, don't just go to look at things that you uh, like. You must take time to go to look at something you know nothing about or that you don't like at all and spend as much time looking at some of those things as well because it will, in fact, encourage you to perform the same function that you do because you have that innate kind of uh, appetite. Well, if, right. I mean, I, it's, it, it's, it becomes a question then, I suppose, of how do you open it up? 
how do you open up the other part? And it's, it's something well, you come that to UMass Boston, of course. Yes, first, exactly. So first, first, exactly. No, I mean, I, quite seriously, I think you do it marvelously. And, and it's, you know, the combination of real scholarship and biography, I think, you know, which you always write about. I think biography has been something that we've been scared a little bit to talk about, certainly in the academy, for quite a while. Um, that's a huge generalization, but certainly when I went to, to university in, in Sydney, at the University of Sydney, there was a strong bias against um, uh, focusing on the lives of artists. And in a way, I understand that bias. And, uh, you know, I believe, I mean, it was coming out of these ideas like death of the author and so on, that the, the work of art is a text that exists on its own and so on and so forth. But I find that biography is often a great key into, into works of art. Um, when you learn about uh, the life of the artist and the social context, of course, and all these other aspects, uh, it's a great way in. But it's not the only way in. And it's something that I think about often as, you know, I've got two young kids and I'm determined not to sort of put them off art for the rest of their lives by, <laughs> you know, dragging them around museums, uh, you know, so that they sort of grow up and say, oh, my dad was an art critic, it was a nightmare, I had to go to museums all the time. <laughs> But I do take them when I can, and we have favorite museums and, and favorite places to go. Um, and I'm always nervous about, I'm always thinking about what's a good way in. And often the best way is just to let kids find their own way through. Um, just like older kids. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but there are so many different ways in. I mean, you know, my son recently plowed through all the Percy Jackson stories. And so when I go through the MFA, it doesn't matter what part of the collection you're in, whether it's ancient coins or 19th century paintings or whatever. There are so many classical myths that are illustrated there. And he was picking out myths left, right and center that, you know, I wouldn't have even known the names of the god or goddess involved. Right. And he knew, them, right. he knew them all off by heart. So it's, it is interesting. There are so many different keys in, I think, right. to, to art. So, but that also implies that actually knowing something Having a few facts at your hand is indeed a good thing, not just to offset the ignorance, but to allow for an entry into this wonderful world. And uh, I think that there is obviously the intimidation about all that. You have to actually work at this a little bit. But I think that the, the, the facts are, of course, certain facts are verifiable. And that gives you a certain platform to operate upon. And then, like with the Duga painting in Kirikushu, there are things that are unverifiable, as you said. So we could make up stories as to why it exists that way. And of course, some art historians do make up stories. That's kind of what we do in a certain way, but we try as hard as possible. There was a, there was a, a wonderful uh, uh, woman reporter who many years ago said to me, said, Paul, if you could meet Monet, what would be your first question? And you know, I didn't hesitate. It just kind of came up from underneath it. And I said, did I even get it this much right? You know? <laughs> because we worry about that. Of course. But I think that your point about access is really important because my mentor, Bob Herbert from Yale, always insisted on two things. One, all art comes from other art. And there are a few students in the audience here and they've heard me say this a thousand times. And I hope it sticks. But art also comes from that intersection of biography, of history, and that past art, a kind of intersecting three circles. And the center of that is really the richness of it all. If either one is sort of discounted, then it seems to me, because I share your notion about biography being important, it seems to me that we lose out on something there. I agree, and I think it has to be a balance of all these things. I suppose what I worry about going to many museums and exhibitions today is, as I said, the the preponderance of explanatory text and this feeling that you have that the institution who, that's put the, the show on is kind of falling over itself to edify and educate and civilize people who come to see these shows <laughs> as if that were the main point. And I frankly find it um, often patronizing and, and not to the point. Uh, it's as if everyone is afraid of talking about aesthetic experience. Now, I don't go around, you know, falling, succumbing to Stendhal syndrome every time I'm in mm -hmm. a museum. It's, I'm not trying to give, give that impression that one, one stands before a work of art and swoons and, and so on. It's not like that at all. Um, but 
it is important to hold on to the value of aesthetic experience. Just as when we go to a concert and listen to uh, Beethoven, if we're sitting there reading the program notes through the concert, it's sort of, it's really beside the point, isn't it? I mean, it's not why we've gone to, 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 to that concert. We've gone to listen. And I think that learning to look with your eyes is one of the, the things that, as a culture, even though we're, we're living in such a visual culture where we're deluged with, with visual stimuli, learning to look at pictures is something that we haven't really focused on as much as perhaps we should. And you know, I, think of, I think that learning to read visually is different from learning to read words. And, and it's a skill that, um, is it a skill? I don't know. It's, it's, it's an ability that has often sort of fallen by the wayside, I think. I remember one of my first experiences at, at college uh, where I had uh, um, a, a, a colleague, perhaps I'm sure you, you know her, um, uh, Virginia Spate. She was a, a, a leading expert, as Paul is, in, in Monet. Uh, she stood us in front of a painting by Bert Morisot that happened to be in the, the gallery in Sydney where we were. And we stood in front of the picture for about 40 minutes, uh, just a group of four or five of us. And for a while, we didn't talk. And then Professor Spate would ask very simple questions, like, what color do you think she's put on first? And where, do you see, where are the highlights? You know, what, what, what's come next? And what do you see in the picture behind the figure here? It's a very simple picture, but it was astounding to me that one could spend that long in front of a picture and stay interested. Because the questions, of course, got progressively more nuanced and subtle and interesting. And the picture is something that I return to whenever I'm back in Sydney with great sort of pleasure because of that memory. Mm -hmm. um, you, you raise an interesting point, and in a couple of minutes we're going to open up to questions, but one of the points is that there are studies done that confirm that for the most part people in museums will look at a work of art for 3.4 seconds and move on and that the kind of tolerance level for full absorption in an aesthetic environment is about 30 minutes. So what we're really talking about are these instants uh, of these literally impressions. And museums really have to work much harder to be able to frame that moment and to guide them in whatever way it's going to be, visually or with information. But my point really is that as you stood there with Virginia in front of that picture for 45 minutes, that was work. I mean, it was pleasure on the one hand, but it also was work. Right. And that you do need to be able to work at these things. You need to develop those kinds of visual critical tools. And that's something that, I, you know, don't mean to interrupt, Paul, but that's something that is obviously very difficult to do. And, you go to a museum, you've gone to the trouble of paying for the parking and the, uh, you know, you, you, you've, you've, you've paid the entrance fees. Kids are hungry. Might, if kids are hungry, <laughs> it might be in a museum that's in another city and you're traveling and you want to see everything there is to see. I've done that so many times. And in those circumstances, it's very hard not to kind of skip through and, you know, tick off pictures that you recognize and that you've heard about and by artists that, that you know by reputation. Um, and that's always understandable and, and natural. Um, but I do enjoy it when museums go to some effort, make some effort to slow us down. And I noticed that just recently Worcester Art Museum, which is one of the great museums uh, in, in this uh, part of the world and indeed in the country. I mean, it's a terrific museum, amazing collection. It did similar research on the speed with which people were moving through its old master galleries. And it decided it needed to mix things up, and they've tried to rehang the you know, three galleries. They've, they've rehung them completely. They've put works in what they call medallions, groups of, of paintings. They've removed wall labels. Instead, you can walk around, a bit like the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum. You can walk around with a, a, a brochure that tells you what the pictures are. Um, they've also hung the pictures forward, the higher pictures especially, forward from the walls so that they kind of come into our space a little bit more. Um, and various other tactics like this, and it seems to be quite successful. And, and it's not, you know, it, people are still going to walk through quickly if they want to, but there's something quite arresting about it that doesn't interfere with the experience of looking at the works of art. They're not trying to slow people down with bells and whistles and, you know, lots of text and so on. 
they're really focusing on the pictures, and that was a solution that I, you know, I really admired. I don't think it's necessarily a long-term solution for all museums, but it was a great attempt anyway. Yeah, I would entirely agree. It's also wonderful to instruct people, if they're going to a particular museum, to go see only a few pictures. You don't have to see right. them all. Right. And uh, I always was a, a nerve when I first was in Paris doing the station work that you'd see the tour buses coming in and they would go see the Venus de Milo, they'd see the, uh, they'd see the Mona Lisa, and then they would be out of there. And I thought this was a terrible thing. It's a whole museum. But there is, some, there is some value in my late age to actually sort of paring things down and really being able, so long as they spend enough time <laughs> with each of those items or whatever else it may be. I agree, uh, I agree. Uh, because in the end, the, the value of works of art is that they are part of a continuum of which we are at the, at, the, at the end of, so to speak, and that they're made by human beings just like you and me, more talented than me. Perhaps Sebastian may be engaged in these things, but you know, the only thing I paint is my house and the clothes I'm wearing. <laughs> and so th that we can understand, not just through skill, but through an immersion in the work and in the history in which they are engaged. The consciousness or unconsciousness that you speak about with, with Freud is, in fact, inflected and enriched by the fact that he's already in that world, that his mental Rolodex is all about imagery and right. about past art. So when that becomes part of our dialogue, when that becomes part of our way of seeing the world, how rich it is. How, how beautifully rich, put, how beautifully how put, yes. But we should, we should uh, open this up to um, um, uh, others' uh, questions or comments if, you, if you'd like. Please feel free, but you'll, you'll be obliged to come up to the, uh, to the microphone here, but please. question because most of us have our exposure to paintings in museums and I wonder if you can explain something I've never understood which uh, whether it's a type of connoisseurship or whatever what was the salon style of hanging paintings in the 16th and 17th century what was that about of, of in, in effect stacking paintings on top of each other, and of course, you know, in all of the Dutch museums and so forth, you, you see that replicated, and you see it in some paintings, mm -hmm. where paintings are stacked on each other. And I wonder if you can just say a word about what that tells us about looking at paintings and what you're supposed to see. <laughs> I'm just going to defer to you, Paul. I think it's a great question. Uh, and. Uh, I don't know if I can answer it with a, with a sort of, you know, say what it was about. Um, it certainly was a dominant style of, of hanging pictures for a long time. And we're seeing, as you say, more and more attempts in museums. I can think of the MFA at the moment, uh, Rhode Island School of Design, Museum of Art, uh, RISD Museum has a, a large gallery that's hung salon style. Many others do as well. Um, of course, it comes out of a particular historical moment. and. Uh, I think of it as attached to the, um, the official annual salon, which were, which were, which were uh, held each year to highlight the latest painting by recognized and officially approved of artists. And it was that tradition of the annual salon hang, of course, that was broken up in the, in the, in the, in the 1860s and 70s. Um, yeah, I mean, Paul, I mean, what, what, yeah, what, what would I you I think say you're, you're quite right. I think it, it also, it's a completely different aesthetic. Right. We're, we're talking about slowing it down and having only a few pictures, and here you enter, you know, the, the Grand Carré of the Louvre, and it's just overwhelming with picture after picture. Uh, but it also speaks about the owners of those pictures, which were mostly the state or some kind of royal environment, and they're collecting it all, and they've got a lot of it, and there's only one way to display them all if, if you want to, in fact, show what you own, and that is to begin stacking them up. Sebastian is quite right, in, in France, at least, in the 17th century, when the Salon began as part of the, the Royal Academy of Painting, uh, they wanted to make sure that everybody had a place there, and it didn't really seem to matter too much 
uh, in terms of how you were going to be able to be shown because you were all part of the academy. It got to be a very big deal come the 19th century where you could be skied, as they would say, and your poor picture was all the way up at the top of the hall, uh, and they're funny, they're funny caricatures by Daumier, who's people in there with these periscopes and binoculars and things looking at their painting. Uh, and there, in that particular instance, size made a big difference as well, and Courbet understood that uh, profoundly. But it really was an entirely different system, it was an entirely different sensibility, it was also a, a kind of gluttony, a visual gluttony to it all, right. which I think we've, we've happily evolved in a, in, a, in a different way. I always found, to be honest, the tapestry gallery at the MFA, when it became filled with pictures, I felt that that was really unfortunate because you can't tell, the normal visitor can't tell what is really the great picture, where is that Zuberon that is really one of the most magnificent paintings in America, and, and it becomes just a kind of mishmash in a way. So. Right, and there's that poignant story, I'm, I'm thinking again of Degas, but where you know, he had painted a picture which he'd labored over for a long time, uh, at the end of the 1850s, early 1860s, of uh, his Italian relatives, the Bellelli family, and uh, he w sort of left it and then returned to it again around 1866 and decided to submit it to the Salon, and it got selected and it was hung, but it was hung so badly and so out of the way that this picture that he'd labored on for such a long time uh, was essentially ignored completely. And he was furious, took it back and sort of swore never to submit to the Salon again. And uh, it stayed in his collection. And when it was sold uh, after he died in 1917, it was regarded as this forgotten masterpiece. So it's, 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 it's amazing the way where a work is hung it can matter so much in that Salon style and yes. it can very much work against great works of art. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have two questions, actually, and they're kind of related. One of them is that, well, the, the title of this program is Learning to Look, and I was hoping that, um, I mean, you've talked about the importance of learning to look, but, I, and to, you know, not go in and try to see 100 paintings at once and to slow it down, but to talk a bit more about, about learning to look, like what you look for. Um, and that's what I'm hoping, you know, um, and, and the, the second part of the question is that uh, you had mentioned about the aesthetic joy of what you see and what you, and for me with contemporary art, um, it's often hard to find anything aesthetically that I find that I love. It feels very intellectual and it almost feels like you have to understand a lot before you can really get what the point of it is. And that you can't just approach it fresh. I mean, you can, but that you'll miss a lot of what it's about, maybe, because it's not really about beauty or, you know, it's about, it seems like intellectual ideas or challenging the very definition of art. So that seems to me like, how do you learn to look at that, too? So thank you. Right, right. Well, why don't I, I you take the first question, okay. I'll take the second. How great. about that? That sounds great. <laughs> uh, you know, when I look at a, a financial statement from somebody that sends me something wrong, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I have no idea. But a dear friend who's a uh, financial advisor can look at that piece of paper with the earnings and this, that, and other thing, and he sees exactly a picture of that particular company. I just see figures. Um, and what he sees is what we hope to be able to train people to see when looking at works of art, at least in part. And that is relationships. Relationships. Works of art are based on relationships. Internal relationships, relationships between the work and the moment in which it's made, relationships between the work and the artist, and relationship between the work and past art. But specifically in terms of learning to look, one of the best things to do is go slowly and to be able to first, of course, start with the large things, what the subject is and how it's arranged within the scene, but then begin to break it down into its individual components because every picture is built upon the very essence of painting, line, color, shape, form, space, surface, materials. And if you simply have those little check boxes 
and be able to look at a work itself, you can begin to see that the artist has constructed this. And every single touch on that canvas, if it isn't some kind of petit accident, it is going to be planned. It's going to be having a reason for being there, even if it is an accident. And it's there because it's in relationship to something else. So one color speaks to another color. The light in one area speaks to the darkness. The twist of an arm speaks to the turn of a leg. The way the figure stands in the foreground has got something to do with what's going on in the middle ground and its relationship to the background, so on and so forth. So if it, if it gets broken down into its individual details, those relationships will become meaningful and poetic. One, one little footnote to that, Saul LeWitt, dear, dear Saul LeWitt, had designed for us at UMass Boston what would have been the largest Saul LeWitt in the world. It was going to be a series of 100 columns built with concrete blocks. And the tier man sends me the plans for this via fax back in the 1990s. So very, very sort of au courant in terms of communication. And what I get is this fax with all these little squares, 100 squares arranged in various ways with numbers inside of them. So I call him up and I said, Saul, this is terrific, I'm so excited. I said, but what do the numbers mean? And he said, the numbers mean the number of courses for each of the columns. I said, really? I said, do you have a, 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 an elevation of it, kind of drawing of it so you can see it in plan? He says, no. I said, really? He said, no. I said, so it's like all in your head? He says, yes. He says, what it's all about, he said, Paul, it's about the relationship of the numbers. <laughs> it took my breath away because I just, I can't, even, I, I, I can't even get there. And so he said that in the end, of course, it's like the relationship of notes in music. Beethoven didn't have to hear the music. He understood those relationships. So when you come to know how a C flat works with an E minor or how a color works with another, then in fact those relationships in the work of art that you're looking at will speak to you with the same clarity and poetry. And LeWitt loved music, didn't he? I mean, oh. he loved Bach yeah. especially. Um, yeah. and, it, and it was all about those mathematical relationships. And LeWitt is a good way into the second part of that question, which I'll try to answer briefly. But um, Paul is absolutely right. I think that's such a key idea that it's all about relationships between things. And all of those things are also, of course, related to ideas. Uh, even pictures, uh, paintings, are always related to ideas. And... Uh, it's true that in the last 30, 40 years or more, um, there's been uh, a particular emphasis on ideas in a lot of contemporary art, conceptual art, we call it. Uh, and uh, some of those ideas um, are well articulated in the work, and some aren't. Some of those ideas are interesting, and some are less so. But there is plenty of great conceptual art, which is both, which is visually arresting, and the ideas are fascinating, and the work itself uh, articulates the idea as well. And even if they're not visually particularly interesting, sometimes the ideas can carry the work. Uh, and even though I certainly you know, feel like I've seen more than my share of, of bad conceptual art, I have no bias against it, because a lot of it, I believe, is great. And I think that a lot of contemporary art that initially people feel um, or find alienating uh, can be great, and a lot of video art for instance, is getting more and more... I think what's happening recently is that uh, a lot of art is be becoming more conceptually sophist sophisticated and more visually sophisticated at the same time. And I'm seeing particularly a lot of great video art recently, which is just visually stunning and so original and amazing, uh, and at the same time grappling with really um, important and interesting ideas. And, and I would simply add that if you don't like it, one, that's okay. But secondly, analyze why you don't like it. Break it down into those components so you can keep them within a certain kind of framework and perspective. And perhaps eventually they may intersect with other things that will indeed appeal to you. Yeah. But yeah, not liking it is absolutely okay. Perfect. And there is a lot of bad Perfect. art out there. There's right. no denying it. But you have uh, to admit so. that there's something that something's bothering you and you have to get to the problem. <laughs> Well, I, I wanted to say I had the good fortune to know Helena Nelkin, who was a art historian and professor at the Harvard Art Department. And my wife and I very much like 
the Peabody Essex Museum for its displays and are somewhat dismayed at the um, middle brow approach to uh, notes at the MFA. And could you please talk about this a little bit? Sorry, I didn't catch the last bit. The, 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 the approach to what at the MFA? Uh, the middle brow approach to notes on the walls. Oh, the wall labels. And so, right, wall labels right. and such. Well, uh, I, uh, I'll weigh into that. Uh, why not? <laughs> I, um, I admire um, actually um, the majority of, of uh, the wall labels at the MFA. I, I think by and large they do a pretty good job. Um, I do, and I've said this in print, I do uh, have problems with the wall labels in the new contemporary wing, the Lindy family wing for contemporary art, which opened a couple of years ago. I do find that they treat the viewer as if the viewer is naturally going to come in feeling hostile or scared of contemporary art. Uh, and so they really kind of dumb it down, I think. You know, it's, it's really quite condescending with big you know, titles saying, what is art and what's it made of? You know, I can't, can't sort of say it without wanting to adopt a Cockney accent. Um, but it's, it's um, what's it all about sort of thing, you know. Um, and I, I find that a little bit obnoxious. But... Um, you know, I, I think that uh, at the MFA generally, in, in, in a lot of the other parts of the museum, they do a great job of picking out interesting facts and not overdoing things. There's one wall label attached to a, um, a, uh, a Chinese scroll painting, uh, or an ink, I should say, an ink painting, which is just beautiful. It's, it's one of, it's the best wall label I've ever read. It just describes what's going on in the painting, which is that a, a boy carrying scrolls is walking down to a couple of scholars who are about to inspect those scrolls. And they, you know, he's passing under a tree. And it's, it's just described in the most poetic and simple way, and yet in a way that's not redundant. It does help you see what's going on in the picture. Um, and I remember sort of taking a little photo of it at the time with my cell phone, thinking, this is the perfect wall label. Um, so, yeah, anyway. Um, I, 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 would, I would simply add, that writing labels, and I've written lots of labels, is a very difficult thing to do because it's so condensed and you want to be able to sound intelligent, you want to provide a kind of access to, to the visitor. Uh, I would entirely agree with Sebastian's assessment of the contemporary uh, labels at the MFA. Uh, there's, a, there's another way to go, perhaps, uh, which I don't necessarily agree with, but a dear friend, Ian Berry, who is the director of the Tang Teaching Museum at Skidmore College, did an exhibition in, of contemporary work in which there were no labels. There, were no, there was no label. You didn't even know who the name of the artist was or what the material was. So you walked into, and, and it was also like the woman who had asked the question before, it was a room that was skied. There were just pictures all over the place. And it, it was... For me, as a historian, it was deeply distressing. I, 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 I felt afloat. I felt like Robert Redford in that movie where he's constantly battling one wave after another. Wasn't that a great movie. Oh, yeah. a great movie. No talking. Uh, but but I, I did understand why he wanted to do it. You know, it was about, in some ways, learning to look and not placing prejudice on the work by the fact that, oh, this is by de Kooning, or this is by, you know, Madame Maud, whatever. Uh, and th th there's just sort of no relationship between the two. So he wanted to be able to try to have people rely upon their personal judgment about those things. And that's, uh, that's, that's a major challenge. Uh, and so that's sort of the opposite of, of extensive labels. Uh, I think labels are important. Uh, they shouldn't be condescending, indeed. They should be helpful in some ways. Uh, but they are very difficult to write. Mm. Yes, sir. I, I had two questions. I just wanted to mention also the Gardner Museum, they don't even put the titles. So mm. you have the option of looking without knowing and then the sheet, of course, right. to identify. Uh, my first question was the idea of the death of art. Has that, has that always been a looming fear? Is it possible? Um, in particular, certain mediums like painting, for instance, I had thought how powerful painting must have been before the advent of photography and certainly cinematography film, is it still a, a meaningful medium, and is it, is it conceivable, perhaps in Western art, that it would die out at some time? And just to say, um, for instance, one concern is when you think in the past you had sent perhaps central narratives, Jesus, mythology, which were communicated in images, 
And besides the limitations of the medium, we also live in a world of very transient narratives. There's no center. So the idea that a work of art can only be as meaningful as the culture from which it came, and we live in such turbulent times, is it conceivable that somebody can make a, a lasting, meaningful work of art? Painting will always last. <laughs> always last. Regardless of anything. Before humans had words, they made images. And if that's the case, since those cave paintings go back thousands of years before the written word, it is innate to the human to be able to make images, mostly, let's say, with painting, right? Um, and that is a profound fact, uh, that the age of painting, the urgency that people have felt to express themselves through this liquid medium that has not changed a great deal over all of those years. So I place profound faith in that. I would also say that painting has been killed off like art has been killed off, but painting in particular has been killed off so many times. It's, it's really the, the phoenix that keeps rising. When Courbet stalked the salon in, the, in 1849 with his big picture of the barrel at Ornon, people thought this really was the death of art. It was horrible. It was dark. It had no compositional uh, flair. There was no color variation. And in the end, of course, out from that grew some of the most profound statements that artists have made. I, I agree with Paul, but um, I, I do think, though, that, that we can't deny that painting is more peripheral to the culture today than it was 200 years ago. Uh, even though record prices are fetched at auction for works of art, and we all know the names of Picasso and Duchamp and whoever, uh, I do think that painting is peripheral and it's probably going to stay peripheral. When I say peripheral, I don't mean way out on the periphery. I just think it's, it's not the central concern of our, of our time. Uh, and I'm actually fine with that. I mean, we, we do have a fundamental need to make images. Um, but of course, making images is easier now than it's ever been. And it doesn't need to be painting. It can be with our cell phone. It can be uh, with, with it, almost anything. Um, but the thing to keep in mind, perhaps, I think, is that for the advent of photography played a huge part in liberating painting. It didn't any longer need to sort of be a slave to the description of visual appearances. Uh, it could be so many other things. And we've watched that uh, continue to be the case and to evolve in extraordinary, unpredicted ways. And I think as well that painting today acts as a kind of antidote in some ways, to our incredibly sort of digital, virtual culture. And I think that is somewhere for me, my gut tells me that's somewhere near the heart of the appeal of museums of painting and sculpture today. People want to go to them, and they do in enormous numbers. I mean, huge numbers of people go to museums. It's comparable to, to going to sporting events. Because they want, precisely because they want an antidote or an escape from uh, the incredibly sort of virtual nature of visual imagery everywhere today that surrounds us. So, uh, I, I, meaning, yeah. Meaningful, lasting and meaningful art for any medium, or does it blow in the wind just like technology? We're always we're turning over uh, narrative. So I'm not, I, I didn't quite ca catch that. We're turning over narrative, and there's so many narratives to create a meaningful work of art, a symbolic work of art, which is powerful compared to painting Jesus 500 years ago. Right, right. Well, I, I think that it's, it's true that it's harder for painting to tap into these universal narratives uh, than it was perhaps when painting was exclusively concerned with, uh, with you know, religious imagery or propping up courtly power. But in a way, that might be a good thing. Painting can tackle so many different kinds of narratives. And there has been a, a kind of privatizing of sensibility, if you like, uh, there aren't these grand universal narratives that painting has access to, but instead personal views on the world which are expressed through painting. And I happen to find that, you know, in many cases, much more compelling, or at least very compelling. And then we shouldn't forget that there are many shared narratives. We all do live in a culture together. And painting can address politics, it can address social conditions, and so many other things that are still shared. So, 
I, I and and even in other medium, I think that you also sort of suggest that, as you say, it sort of blows in the wind. The most difficult thing, and this is why Sebastian is such a terrific critic, the most difficult thing is to be of your time and to be able to recognize the value of work made in your time. There are museums around the world who were devoted to modernist art, and their storerooms are filled with mistakes that they thought was, in fact, at a time, were going to be the great works. And you see that in the market, or the market changes in, in various other ways. But there is a kind of, of pressure that people do feel to be able to try to understand their moment. And of course, having that distance, conscious or unconscious, as Freud would say, is an extremely challenging proposition. The other question is, and that's why I saw a beautiful Picasso quote recently. He's, they asked him, you think uh, photography threatened painting? He goes, no, like you said, it liberated. He goes, now I know what painting isn't. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. painting right. isn't photography. Um, yeah, a lot of great quotes. The idea when we talk about art history, um, I st I st maybe it's my own limited uh, reading, I still feel that we have a Western European uh, hegemony. Even when I read Gombrich, we, we, we reference other cultures, at, you know, briefly, but they don't share a central place. And the question is, is that true? For instance, you have an entire continent, South, South America. Okay, so I heard of Diego Rivero. But haven't they made our contributions to history beyond uh, half a chapter in a book? And uh, is that true, and why am I missing it? Well, I, I mean, I think that you're absolutely right. There has been, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the, the art world has been sort of centralized around particular cities and particular concentrations of wealth for a long time. Uh, but over the last 30, 40 years, that has changed enormously. And, uh, you know, great contemporary artists aren't all just coming from the one place. They're coming from all over the world now. And we see that more and more. Right now at the MFA, there's a show of uh, Latin American contemporary art, which is terrific. Uh, and many other museums are, uh, are making similar efforts to expand their, their repertoire. And they could do a lot more, uh, and I, I hope that they will. As someone from Australia who you know, grew up with artists who are all household names in Australia, but you know, I can assure you that none of you will have heard of any of them. I'm acutely conscious of, of that problem and how difficult it is for artists in some parts of the world to get recognized. But we're finding more and more that terrific artists are emerging from Africa, from South America, from Asia. And uh, that's just as it should be, and we need to do more to pay attention to those artists. Ma'am, thank you for waiting. Um, I want to share it with you, both of you. I've been talking about catalyze, catalyzing experiences um, in looking at art, as one learns to see. And I, each of you has provided for me a profoundly cat <laughs> catalyst experience. One is when I was a young art history student, um, I, we had to, at that, that age, we had to lose, um, excuse me, we had to memorize hundreds and thousands of slides, <laughs> titles, dates, um, you know, where they were done. <laughs> and, um, and I was on that route, and, and I came down to Boston to see an exhibit of Monet that was put together, curated by you. And I must say that I was not I loved Impressionism in, this, in a sense, but I was not enthralled with Impressionism, <laughs> per se. <laughs> I was interested in some other um, genres and, and styles. Um, but what happened to me in that exhibit, it, it was a catalyzing experience of looking to see, and I have never forgotten it, and I have never experienced it again, and I'll tell you specifically what happened. I. In, when I went into the exhibit, I walked through and I saw the paintings and I saw them and could identify them and so on and so forth. And then I had spent enough time in there that the light in the new Wang um, build, it, it's the Wang, isn't it? Yeah, the, the new Wang. Wing. Yes, right. the new Wang, right. Um, began to change. And it had a glass, um, it had, it, it may, I don't know if it still does, but it had a glass ceiling that allowed in natural light that was controlled to some degree by ultraviolet filters. So as the light changed over the few hours that I was there, it was the only time that I have ever wanted to stay in a museum and in an exhibit 
for 24 <laughs> hours because I finally understood or was getting to understand what Impressionism was about, what color was about for that, for that particular um, style, and also for, the, and for those painters, and for how profound it was as a, for, the, for, for seeing. So that was, I, I've never forgotten it, <laughs> and I thank you. Thank you. And then, um, Sebastian, you too wrote recently about something that was a catalyzing experience for me. As, at about the same time that I saw the um, Monet exhibit, we, I, we were required in my school to also take, uh, if you were going to be an art history ma major, you had to take three or four studio courses as well. So I was taking oil painting one, and um, of all the museums, we had to copy. Um, a painting, and of all the museums in New England, and all the paintings in New England, <laughs> I chose Manet's Girl with a Blue Ribbon, which you wrote about uh, just this Tuesday. week. <laughs> it's a beautiful and, picture. And this was another catalyzing experience. Um, well, we I, had think, I think it's, it's wonderful that you raise those, those examples. And, and um, I think it's true that art love, and perhaps this is something I, you know, I should have said when, it, when I was talking, but art love, if it comes on us, it's usually born of these kinds of epiphanies, if you like, these, as you say, catalyzing experiences. Yes. And, um, it's very hard to know when they're going to come and, and, and how to bring them about, and wall labels aren't going to do it. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen as an experience with a work of art in a gallery at a particular time of day, and it's very hard to... to um, to make that happen, but it's a wonderful thing when it does, and, and it's one of those things that once it gets its hooks into you, it's, it's um, hard to let go of, or it doesn't let go of you. Well, you never know when it's going to happen, right. um, is another thing. And then it right. is, with this Manet, with this Manet that you were writing about, um, as I spent hours and hours and hours with an easel and my oil paints in the Museum of Fine Arts trying to copy it, and um, eventually presented it in class with one of the eyes rubbed out because I couldn't I could not get it right enough. <laughs> and so, as, so in reading your article um, that you wrote just this week, um, I was brought to revisit that entire experience of trying to learn to see what it was Manet was, was how he was painting and how I could not understand it at the time. <laughs> so I thank both of you very, very much. And thank, you okay. thank you. Thank you. I'd like to turn the conversation a little bit to public art. You've been talking a lot about museums and art in museums and art in galleries and art that's been, been commissioned by royalty and stacked up to, you know, it's like wearing all of your clothes at once to show people you have them. Um, but public art is, is, I know, Paul, that you have been very active creating gallery of public art and you've written about public art. And public art seems to live in a slightly different space, and it not only has to interact with an individual viewer who's paid an admission fee and come to see it, but it has to have an impact on a public place. How does that happen? Well, I think one of the most critical factors of how it happens is, and it seems very obvious, but it gets played out, unfortunately, not always so significantly, and that is choice. That a, a work of art, public work of art, primarily, let's talk, let's narrow it down to say, a piece of sculpture. A piece of sculpture is a three-dimensional plastic mass that acts in space. And it needs to be able, back to the issue of relationships, it needs to be able to have a set of relationships with wherever it is that makes it not only dynamic in its space, but creates a space around it that is equally charged, at least in my opinion. And that has everything to do with the specific qualities, specific characteristics of that piece, its size, its color, its materials, its, uh, its orientation within that space. Because unfortunately, and uh, Sebastian's piece was so terrific about public art in Boston, I was like, 
finally someone is really saying things. Of course, the only thing I had to disagree with that UMass Boston again, didn't get a lot of ink in all, but I, nonetheless, that my mistake. that's okay, Forgive it's okay. Uh, we, we hadn't seduced him across Morrissey Boulevard yet, but nonetheless, the bottom line is that um, there are so many instances where public art of the 20th century, there's many, many other things about the 19th century one could say, the public art has really just been plopped down or is located in a, in a way that is not really respectful of the work or of the way that people are going to encounter that work. Um, and it's really, to my mind, deeply distressing. The 19th century in Boston did it extremely well. You look at, at Kamev, you look at, uh, at the public garden, there are things that are just terribly moving. As long as one gets into that mindset, for many other people like my students, they see a lot of dead old white men. Uh, and they, they're not so moved by them. But there was, at a moment, real concern and care. And in fact, within this room is Ruth Butler, who is a professor for emeritus at UMass Boston, who's writing a book about public sculpture and bronze sculpture in particular here in Boston. And I hope that we will all be able to enjoy it when it is completed. Uh, and it will reveal, I'm sure, these kinds of uh, of desires on the part, particularly in the 19th century, of the people of Boston to be able, and Cambridge, I should say, since we're here, the people of Boston Cambridge, to be able to pay homage to people or to events of considerable importance. The Shaw Monument, for example, one of the great pieces of 19th century sculpture. It's just fantastic. But when things are, are not given the kind of, of real intellectual, aesthetic, and and almost political social uh, concern about where it's going to go, then it almost always will fall flat. It'll become decorative, it'll become uh, 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 indistinct, it will become uh, a leaning post or a place for skateboarding. <laughs> It's, um, it's, a, it's a great subject, and, and I also look forward to that book, and, and it's great that you mentioned the Shaw Memorial, because there's a wonderful show right now at the Massachusetts Historical Society, uh, all about that, that wonderful monument, and it was organized by the National Gallery in Washington. Uh, it's, it's fabulous, and one of the things it does is uh, remind us of how ambitious that work was, and indeed many of these other bronze sculptures, which... You know, I was probably a little rude about it in my article because I was saying there's such a preponderance of them and, and there's not any sort of, um, in the city of Boston, not much balancing work of greater uh, dynamism and, and contemporary sort of feeling and, and, uh, and so on. But that work or that show about the Shaw Memorial really reminds us of how ambitious it was and how brilliantly conceived and carried off and how it is such a, a wonderful... Um, memorial to this 54th regiment, not just um, Colonel Shaw, but the, more importantly, the 54th regiment of African-American soldiers uh, who suffered terrible losses, but at the same time um, did such a great thing uh, for their people. And obviously, you know, it was just such a, a crucial time. The exhibition has copies of the of the Emancipation Proclamation, and it's got letters written to President Lincoln complaining about these soldiers still getting unequal pay for their efforts. Uh, and it really tries to uh, literally put a face on many of those uh, African, African American soldiers, uh, who, of course, in that memorial are unfortunately anonymous because Shaw didn't have uh, them to work from or even photographs of them to work from. Uh, but there are actually photographs of many of those soldiers, and they're in this exhibition. And we learn about them, we see them, and we learn about their lives. And it's absolutely fascinating um, and incredibly touching. Uh, yeah, I, Paul has just done amazing things, which I've been slow to cotton onto. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's interesting that it's often um, New England's college campuses that have been much more... Um, ambitious in terms of public sculpture. MIT is another place which has great public sculpture on campus. Um, but people like Paul are doing terrific things to, to, to change the story, which is, which is wonderful. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I wanted to uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I was wondering whether you could guess what um, the history of art will be in the future about now. 
<laughs> no idea. That's a, it's a fun question. Uh, Paul, what do you think? <laughs> well, I suppose it's sort of like someone who could ask a stockbroker, you know, what's going to be the great company in the next five years or so? Lord knows. And that's the beauty about, about human activity in, in the world of culture and the arts, that the unexpected will always be the expected. And it goes back to what I think uh, uh, Sebastian had rightly pointed out, and that is that painting is no longer the absolute central. There are so many ways for artists to be able to make work that may not even be considered in most terms to be art. And how that is going to be written and codified, how it's even going to be collected or presented to a future public is going to be an extraordinary challenge. And so since I'm so old, I will leave that to a next generation. <laughs> I guess it just feels like, um, you know, the history of art is, is, it's not simple, but it's, easier to understand and it seems like that there's so much diversity now yes. um, I'm I'm wondering I guess what's trending or um. well I, I think the other factor is that there are more artists working today than ever before by I mean it's an exponential factor I mean you think about the artists who are being turned out by art schools by um, amateur artists all over this city and probably every other city in, in this country and all over the world uh, Art has a prestige now, just calling yourself an artist has a prestige now that it perhaps probably never had before. And that's something to celebrate. Uh, but it also becomes a very confusing prospect for, for people who are trying to sort out, as you say, art history. Um, and uh, another thing I think that's true is that critics are playing a smaller and smaller role in determining that. I mean, when we look at the history of um, uh, of the 19th century, we often go to the writings of critics responding to the art of their time. Uh, there's just so much being produced now, there's so much contemporary art, that it's very hard for any critics, and there are fewer of us, of course, to sort of get to grips with that. And our, often our brief is to write about historical shows as well, and we, we try to balance it, but it's, it's terribly difficult. And I, don't th I think it's going to be in the hands of curators at museums more than any other category of people. And I think that a lot of the uh, ideas they're laboring under, in many cases, are going to seem pretty quickly out of fashion. Um, I'm thinking of a lot of, kind of certain kinds of conceptual art and political art which seem, at the, t you know, at the moment, they're made very kind of, of the moment. I think a lot of that stuff uh, which needs a lot of explaining and, 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 uh, and so on, is going to fall by the wayside pretty quickly. So certain kinds of art that seem quite dominant now, I would be surprised if they, if they last the distance, so to speak. I think this will be our, our last question, so thank you so much for waiting. I hope it's a good one. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Any question is a good one. Yeah, I'm, I'm an artist and a photographer, and I do a lot of, participate in a lot of shows around uh, Boston. And I'd like you to comment a little bit on the local events, you know, for instance, especially the ones that are like salons, like the Danforth Museum one that's coming up, like the Mass Art Auction that happened a few weeks ago. I think the MFA does one too, where there are a lot of artists from a lot of places doing a lot of different things. And, you know, you mentioned that you have a tough time going into some of these situations because, okay, how do you qualify or quantify or whatever? How do you, you know, be a critic about it? Um, you know, we're all critics ourselves, too. So I'm just wondering how you guys deal with that and, you know, where that's going to go. Basically, the local, the local scene, what's going on. Yeah, yeah, well, there's just so much, like I said, and it's, it's wonderful. I mean, uh, recently, I mean, there's all the open studios, Somerville Open Studios, where I live. Uh, you always see amazing stuff, and it's, it's incredibly encouraging and heartening. Uh, it's very hard as a newspaper critic, though, to, to, to keep up with all these things. And, uh, uh, you know, part of you sort of just gives up about any idea of sort of covering it all. It used to be the case, even in the 1950s and 60s, that a, a critic in New York could cover everything he or she needed to cover in a day by going around a dozen galleries and, and that was pretty much it. Um, now, you know, you could spend your whole life just 
in Chelsea between you know 21st and 26th Street or whatever it is. You know, it's it's um, it's absolutely overwhelming and dizzying. And then when you throw in all the open studios and and uh, art auctions and all these other events, um, it's it's staggering the quantity of stuff. But I, on the whole, see that as a as a as a great thing. It's a sign that people care about art, love art, and uh, um, and and you know that that it is you know, not as peripheral as I was perhaps suggesting before to our culture, it's, it's right there at the heart of things. So it's got to be a good thing and, and uh, you know, artists, are, as you say, are great critics of, of each other and often a buzz is created about certain kinds of work or certain artists and hopefully that um, reaches other people and curators and critics and, 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 and goes from there. It's, it's, a, it's always a very unpredictable business though, that's for sure. <laughs>